The reading is taken from Acts chapter 22, beginning at verse 2. You'll find it on page 1119 in your church Bibles. When they heard Paul speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see his right, the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is uh, from the Gospel of Mark, and it's chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, and it's on page uh, 1006 in the Pew Bible. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained, hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones." 
When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged him to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Tony and Jenny. Two quite long readings today, but what cracking stories. And it seems a shame to cut them down um, so that, to make them shorter. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the big story of your love and your salvation. We thank you also for the smaller stories of individuals and lives changed. Give us ears to hear what you're saying to us today and hearts willing to respond. Amen. Yesterday afternoon, a group of us from Sunnyside went to Illsbury to watch an Inspector Calls. Some of you will have seen it, possibly the film or the play production. Some of you will even have the joy of studying it at school. If you haven't done it yet, you will be. And some of you will have had the joy of helping other people study it. It's a powerful story that had all of the R's that Andrew gave us last week. It has relevance and resonance and reach and redemption and a ring of truth. And also, frankly, it was a cracking piece of theatre, so do go if you get the chance. Now, I have to confess, I would not have spent my afternoon at a lecture that, and this is a description of the play, that denounces the hypocrisy and callousness of capitalism and argues that a just society can only be achieved if all individuals feel a sense of social responsibility. I'm sure it'd be a fascinating lecture, but I don't think I'd have rushed back from Lancashire to do it. However, I did spend my afternoon very willingly and engaged, and I didn't have a snooze, watching a story about the privileged Burling family and how their actions affected a working class girl called Eva Smith. And the play, since I saw it, has made me think about the impact of our actions, of my actions and our assumptions, my assumptions and prejudices on others. That is the power of story. Now, as hopefully you've worked out, we're in the middle of this Talking Jesus season, and we've begun it with a short sermon series which finishes today, which is entitled Call to Tell. We began by thinking about the power of story and how not only are we called to tell others about Jesus, but we need to tell them. 
And last week, Andrew talked about not only God's big story, but some of the small stories within it and how they all had those five qualities, those five R's, which in a way, his talk last week acted as a taster for our Lent sermon series, where we're going to look at more detail of God's story and the stories within it. That starts next week because it's Ash Wednesday. Lent starts this week. This week, I want us to think about how we might tell stories as a way of talking about Jesus with our family and friends. So we had these two powerful readings, two powerful stories of the difference Jesus made to two men's lives. There are stories that include women's lives and women having a, a transformation as well, but these two I particularly felt led to include today. There was Jesus meeting with the demon-possessed man, a man whose suffering was absolutely immense. He was naked, he was deeply disturbed, he was doing what we'd now call self-harming, he was uncontrollable, and he was cast out from society, so living amongst the tombs. And we heard how Jesus restores not only his mind, but his dignity and enables him to return to his community. It was such an enormous transformation that when the people from the town come to Jesus to discover what's going on and why all these pigs have ended up across the top of the cliff, they saw the man who was possessed by the legion of demons, we're told, sitting there dressed and in his right mind. Now, the man understandably wanted to go with Jesus, but Jesus wouldn't let him. Instead, he'd sent him to go and tell his story to his friends and neighbours. Jesus said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. Now, as we read stories of Jesus encountering people in the New Testament, he often tells people he's healed not to go and tell others. So why is it different this time? Well, the key and the clue is in the name of the place, the Decapolis, which was 10 cities across the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where the majority of people were Gentiles. Now, Jesus had only got three years for his mission here on earth. He hadn't got time to spend lots of time hanging out in the Decapolis. So he sent this man to go and tell the people there about him. And we're told all the people were amazed. And then we had Paul's story. Paul was one of the greatest theologians the church has ever known. And we heard in our reading how he was taught by Gamaliel. So he got one of the best educations it was possible to get. It was like going to Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard and Yale all at the same time. It was the best education a young man could have as a Jew. And we know, because some of us have struggled with reading them, if we're honest, that some of those letters of Paul in the New Testament, which are some of the earliest writings we've got, are full of theology, aren't they? Some of it requires a bit of help working it out because it's so rich. But what we also read in Acts and Letters is this great theologian tells his story five times and one of them is the time we've just heard there were five times recorded where he thought rather than giving them a good dose of theology i'm going to say what jesus has done for me now in our reading paul's in prison because he there was a riot in jerusalem over his theology and his teaching and in it he gave his established his jewish credentials and then told his story. He talked about what happened on the road to Damascus, a phrase we still use, don't we? Damascian transformation, conversion. The story of when he encountered Jesus and the way that Jesus turned him from one of the greatest persecutors of the early Christians to one of the greatest evangelists the church has ever known. Jesus called him to be a witness to all people of what he'd seen and heard. And so he was. Stories are powerful things. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, it turns out that neuroscience has discovered hearing stories actually changes how our brains work. They help our brains care 
and remember. Journalists know this. This is why we see so many personal stories in the news. I was flicking through the newspaper yesterday and I was going to tot up how many stories there were, but I lost count. But one of the ones that struck me when I was driving down from Lancashire yesterday, so I heard the news quite a lot of times, is this story. The scale of suffering in Turkey and Syria is hard to comprehend, isn't it? I don't know what 45,000 people dead looks like. It's a terrifying thought. But yesterday's news was full of this chap, Christian Atsu, the footballer who'd been found dead in the rubble of his home in Hatay. A chap that many people in this country would have known when he played for various teams. Chelsea was one of them, I think. And therefore a story that might resonate with us as we try and think about the implications of the earthquake. When I was driving up north this week, I listened to a programme on the radio. It was called I Feel, Therefore I Am. It was fascinating and, if I'm honest, somewhat alarming. And I do recommend it to you. Find it out on BBC Sounds. It was extraordinarily interesting. And it explores the fact that facts are no longer seen as the path to knowledge. Lived experience and my truth are now really important. Now, when most of us who were over the age of 40 wrote essays at school or university, if we'd included, I feel, it wouldn't have gone down very well, would it? We'd have got a big mark against it. Whereas now, that's considered a good thing to include in our understanding of things like the essays we write about an inspector calls. There are things about it that are somewhat unsettling, but it does mean that personal stories are now one of the most powerful ways we can share our faith in today's culture, showing how God's story has relevance and resonance, reach and redemption, and most importantly to those people around us, the ring of truth. So it's good to think about what our story is and how we might tell it so that when we have opportunities, we're ready to do it. Now, it may be the story of what God's been doing, like the God at work stuff that we did earlier in the service and we do in lots of meetings at Sunnyside. Or it might be the larger story of our journey to faith. And I suggest there were three key questions. Some of you may recognise these. When we did the, the sermon series on God's story, our story, a couple of years ago, we had members of the church family, didn't we? Stood up and shared their story. I remember Andrew doing it. These three questions. When did you become a Christian? What made you decide to follow Jesus? And how has knowing Jesus made a difference to your life? We saw all those three questions in the three, two stories we heard from in the Bible. Now, I've often told you my story, but I thought I'd do it slightly differently. How might I answer those? Well, I became a Christian at a mini mission at university in February 1990. It was this week just gone, so it's my Christian anniversary. On the second night of the mission, I made a commitment to follow Jesus that I have sought to maintain, sometimes better than others, over the past however many years that is. I was very young when I went to university. Why did I decide to follow Jesus? Well, on that night in that mission, it suddenly discovered that the, quest, the answer to the questions I'd been asking about life, the universe and everything turned out not to be a what, but a who. It turned out that Jesus was the answer to the questions. And I've always found this quote from C.S. Lewis really helpful. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. There were big stories I could tell and have told about the difference following Jesus has made to my life, but I thought I'd choose one from this week just gone. Now, many of you know and were very kindly praying for me that this week the reason I had to go north was for the funeral of a dear friend. There's Bridget sat in the middle between me and Bev in happier times. 
our friendship was rooted in our shared faith and we had prayed together as a triplet for 12 and a half years. That shared relationship with Jesus meant that although the funeral and her death is desperately sad, we were able to be full of thankfulness and the whole service was threaded through with hope as well as memories of the importance of tea made properly in teapots, which is why I chose that picture, because there's lots of tea in pots. This week has been incredibly difficult. If it was this hard with God, I wouldn't want to have done it without him. And knowing that Jesus was there, knowing that you and others were praying, meant that we got through it with some smiles in the midst of the tears. So, what is your story? When did you become a Christian? What made you decide to follow Jesus? How has knowing Jesus made a difference to your life? Or perhaps if you're on a journey, haven't got there yet, what is it that brings you to church this morning? We're going to have a chance to practice because if we can't tell our brothers and sisters here in Sunnyside the answers to those questions, we're going to find it really hard to do it in the big, wide world. So can I encourage you to turn to somebody next to you, preferably somebody who doesn't already know your story, and answer those three questions. When did you become a Christian? What made you decide to follow Jesus? And how has knowing Jesus made a difference to your life? Go. I never like really drawing conversations to a close, but I'm going to sort of draw them to a pause. Imagine it is a semicolon rather than a full stop. And do feel free to continue afterwards. Oh, Tim, it's not going forward. (laughs) There we go. I've always been encouraged and challenged by this verse in Peter. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. It's the always that's a challenge, isn't it? But the be prepared is why it's quite helpful for us sometimes to have thought through what would we say if somebody asked. The truth is that we live in a society where most people haven't rejected God They've just not thought about him. We live in a society that values stories, and particularly stories about where faith makes a difference to our lives. It was really encouraging, I thought, that in the Talking Jesus report, which I've mentioned before, one in five of those non-Christians who've had a conversation about Jesus are open to hearing more. One in five people. That's extraordinary. So let's be encouraged And let's be challenged. Let's be encouraged to be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks us for the reason, for the hope we have. But let's be challenged to think, how could we share our story this week? And how could we listen to the stories of somebody else who doesn't yet know Jesus and help them see how their story is part of God's big story? You and I may not have benefited from the level of theological education that Paul had. But we are all experts in our own story. And all we're called to do is to tell that story to others. Amen.